السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله يا ما بعد. Many times, many classes and lectures, we've spoken on the etiquette of the student of knowledge in general, and also the etiquette or the manners of the student of hadith specifically. And uh, not to reiterate these same points, obviously we have limited time. The student of knowledge and the do's and the don'ts that he or she must abide by and adhere to are pretty much the same as the do's and the don'ts that the talib of hadith, the student of hadith has to abide by and adhere to. However, we've said and we've explained that there are certain principles, certain practices in which the student of hadith exceeds and excels beyond the student of knowledge of another discipline. Of he or she who studies all of the fields of Islam, al tafsir, al fiqh, al hadith, al lugha, etc., or a student of knowledge who specializes in one of those fields. So, the one who specializes in the sciences of hadith and he wishes or she wishes to make him or herself a true disciple of hadith, then there are certain things that, uh, which you're supposed to be better and above the average, and which you're supposed to be the elite from among the tulab al. Uh, in. But the uh, original default ruling is that the things that the student of hadith is to do or not to do are no different than that of the student of knowledge. And the etiquette of the student of knowledge in reality is the etiquette of a Muslim. It's the etiquette of a, of a practicing Muslim, of a pious Muslim. But there are certain things in which the student of knowledge has to be above and beyond. And there are certain things in which the disciple of hadith has to be above and beyond. Spirituality, avoiding doubtful things, uh, your work ethic, and the list goes on, and the list goes on. So, in this session, we're going to mention some beautiful speech from uh, the things in which the uh, master and the apprentice both share, in which it is an obligation upon the hadith teacher and an obligation upon the hadith learner, the one who's finished and the one who's beginning his or her journey in learning hadith. And these rules this etiquette, these manners, this mode of behavior, it applies to those who are studying hadith and sciences in Arabic and also those who are studying them in English. But if you're self-respecting and you want to take it to the next level, then it's very important be the Nantala for you to hear what we're about to read to you. We're reading from the book Adab al Alim Wal Mutalim Wal Mufti Wal Mustafti, the etiquette of the learner and the teacher. The Master and the Apprentice by an nawi rahimahullah ta'ala, which is an extraction from his book Al-Majmu' Sharh Al-Muhadhab, the introduction to his uh, large voluminous or his, his, his large work, exhaustive work, many volumes, in which he explained uh, the fiqh of the Shafi'i Madhab in detail. And in the beginning of the book, he makes a very beneficial introduction, in which he talks about the etiquette of the learner and the teacher, in which he talks about the etiquette of the mufti and the mustafti. One who's giving the fatwa and one who's asking for the fatwa. And obviously that's a lecture or a lesson or a session in itself. And that is everyone is responsible and everyone is liable. Everyone is responsible and liable. There is no, the student of knowledge is responsible for doing bad things, saying bad things, causing problems, causing chaos and havoc and mayhem, but the sheikh isn't. And... He misinterpreted the words of the scholar and it's his fault for... No, the scholar is responsible as well. The mufti and what fatwa he gives and who he gives that fatwa to and how he explains it, he's responsible and he's held liable. So there is a, a, an etiquette for both. For both. No, we don't know what he says here. Faslun fi adabin yashtariku fi al-alimu wal mutalim. The section of the chapter of the manners or the etiquette in which the student and the teacher share. And this is also very applicable to the student of hadith. Things that the learner and the teacher must do and cannot do, should do and shouldn't do. He says first and foremost, يَنْبَغِي لِكُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِنْهُمَا أَنْ لَا يُخِلَّ بِوَظِيفَتِهِ لِعُرُوضِ مَرَضٍ خَفِيفٍ وَنَحْوِهِ مِمَّا يُمْكِنُ مَعَهُ عَلَى اشْتِغَالُ وَيَسْتَشْفِي بِالْعِلْمِ وَلَا يَسْأَلْ أَحَدًا تَعَنُّتًا وَتَعْجِيزًا فَالسَّائِلُ تَعَنُّتًا وَتَعْجِيزًا لَا يَسْتَحِقُ جَوَابًا وفي الحديث 
النهي عن غلطات المسائل. The first point that he mentions is listen carefully because we know that the etiquette of the student of knowledge or the etiquette of ilm, the manners of knowledge, there are three categories. There are things which are specific to the learner. There are things which are specific to the teacher. And there are things in which the learner and the teacher share. There are things in which the teacher, the master, the sheikh, the imam, the alim is not to do. And there are things that the learner is not to do. Okay? An example of this is, we talk about humility. In which, this is a good example for all three categories. Every Muslim has to be humble. As the Prophet ﷺ has informed us. إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَوْحَى إِلَيَّ أَن تَوَضَرُ Hadith says that Allah has revealed to me that you should be humble, humble yourselves. Every Muslim has to be humble on one level or another. When we talk about systematic humbleness or humility in a class, in a circle, a halaqa of ilm and of hadith, the teacher has to be humble for his students. And he's not allowed to puff himself up with pride and arrogance and conceit. I know everything. I'm the, I'm the sheikh. I'm the imam. What do you know? He can't do this. But he doesn't share the same amount of humility of that of the learner. There's no question about that. The learner has to humble him or herself. And this humbleness or this humility is manifested in many, many, many ways. Many ways. To the extent that some of the ulama, they say, such as Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, rahimahullah ta'ala, that when you go to a muhaddith, a scholar of hadith, and you sit on his bisat, his carpet, his rug, you should take your shoes off. You should not wear shoes and walk on his carpet because taking off the shoes is a manifestation of humility and respect. Now, what's the ruling on praying with shoes? Is this absolute? Is haram to wear shoes if you're in a class? That's not the topic of our discussion. We're just trying to make a point that there is a manifestation of humility, of tawadr. And some of them, they use the ayat in the Quran and Kareem with regards to Musa والسلام, and him being in the holy valley. Huh? Innaka, Allah Azza he says, Bilwad al muqaddasi tuwa. You're in the sacred valley of Tuwa. Fakhla na'alayka. And Surah Ta'a, Allah says, Take your shoes off. Take your sandals off, O Moses. You're in the sacred valley of Tuwa. So they say that the student who's going to the Hadith scholar should not wear shoes. The point is, is that there's a manifestation of humility. Is that the same of the Muhaddith? Does he have to take off his shoes? Should he take off his shoes? The point I'm trying to get to is that there's a certain amount of humility that the teacher must have. Of course. Humility for Allah. Humility for ilm and show respect to his students. But it's also in the, the amount of humility that the learner has to show is not like that of the teacher. No. The student of knowledge has to lower and humble himself for the teacher. And he may feel a certain way or think a certain way or he may know something, but the bottom line is it's your teacher. He doesn't have to be right. You may do it better, but he is older and he has more knowledge than you and he's been doing it along with you. Bottom line. Bottom line. So, there's a humility that the teacher must have. There's a humility that the student must have. And then there is a shared level of humility between the teacher and the student. And the same applies to other things. Al-ikhlas, sincerity. The teacher has to be sincere. The student has to be sincere. And both of them have to be sincere. But the teacher doesn't have to sacrifice certain things. Such as the teacher sending the student on an errand. And his wisdom. And a student running errands for the teacher's wisdom. And many youth, they may find a problem with this, or you're just trying to use me, or I'm just your slave, or your flunky. It's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. Huh? The master, before he teaches the student any arts, he makes him do chores. And they're oftentimes menu chores, base chores, cook this, wash this, take this, gather this. It's a wisdom behind that. If you're unwilling to humble yourself for a, for a dunya reason, how much humility will you have for the deen? What should I teach you if you can't do a basic service for me? Bring me some tea. Basic. Simple. In other words, the manifestation of you bringing me the tea and pouring the tea may be a sign to show that this person is willing to stifle his ego and to humble himself. You're my teacher. I'm going to give you the tea. You get your own tea. I'm not your slave. I'm not your servant. Who are you? I'm not your flunky. I'm not going to the store and buying you dinner. Who are you? Many people have this attitude. But it's deeper than that. So if you can't prove that you have humbleness or loyalty or consistency or even deeper than that, how you get the tea and pour the tea, how you make the tea, what type of thing you get from the store, it can show the level of your natural intelligence. And you naturally may not have the intelligence that's needed to be my personal student. 
I'm not speaking about myself. My knowledge is limited. I'm speaking about the concept. You may lack the natural intelligence. You're a hard worker. You're sincere. But you just don't have the talent. You don't have what it takes to be of my caliber student. And that can be manifested through a worldly act. And that's easier and sometimes kinder and soft on a person's feelings than have them read the book of Hadith, study, and then you say, just stop, please. Oh, you heard in my ears. Don't read anymore. The person may be crushed. But they serve you worldly things, and it's shown that they don't have that level of intelligence. You may teach them something else or on a, a lower level. I really understand this. So there's wisdom in this, let alone just dedication and devotion and how thorough a person is and how much are you willing to give. This has to be proven. Before I even talk about Bukhari or anything, come to the class consistently. We tell the brothers. Mufti, write me a letter of recommendation for Medina. Some brothers we have written letters for. Some of them have went to Medina. Others haven't. Most haven't. But some brothers who say, I can't write you a letter. Or come to the class. Keep coming to the class. Where are the brothers right now that will come to the class that, that, that said that they wanted a letter? They, went to, they came to the class for two or three nights and then they stopped. So if you can't come consistently to my dunce, what makes you think that you deserve a letter of recommendation to go to the Prophet's city and study? What heck is that? What heck is that? So therefore, the humility of the teacher is not like the humility of the, of the learner. But the teacher does have to have some type of humility and ikhlas and there are many other things. And there are certain etiquettes which are specific to the teacher and certain etiquettes which are etiquette or an etiquette that is specific to the student and there are things which are in the middle. So this chapter here, Nawi Rahim al Taala, he says, the adab yashtariku in which the, the teacher and the student, they make shirk, partnership. They're partners in this. Linguistically using the word shirk, ishtirak, ishtaraku, yeshtariku. They're partners in which there isn't monotheism, in which is only singling out the sheikh and its etiquette, or only singling out the student. But it's what? They both have the responsibility of this. The first thing that he mentions is, listen carefully, and there lies no doubt this is for the student of knowledge, but specifically for the hadith disciple, for the learner of hadith. He says, you are to be a hard worker, and you're not to infringe upon and violate your duty, your job, with any type of reason or excuse, such as, he says, maradin khafifin. He says, slight sickness. So this means that a student of knowledge, which he shouldn't, but hypothetically speaking, as they say, a student of the Qur'an, hypothetically speaking, or of the Qira'at, or of fiqh, and there's no disrespect to those sciences. The best of you are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it. But the discipline of Qira'at and of tafsir and fiqh is not like that of the student of hadith. There's no question about that. And that is why the stereotype and the reputation of the college of hadith in Medina is like no other college. No other college. And there was a brother once who was from my city. There was a point in time in which he was young. And there was a point in time in which he was talented, in which he was very, very promising. I was young myself, but I had been overseas, I had learned. He was very promising, very respectful, beautiful, sweet brother, inshallah. And he wanted to study and he wanted to learn. And he came up to me and he walked up to me with the glassy eyes and the bubble head, the bobble head, you know, with a bright face. You studied in Medina? You were with Sheikh such and such? You, you went overseas, you were in Medina? How can I go? And I, wallahi, I remember when that was me, with the glassy eyes and the, the head movement and being impressed and so amazed at someone that was in the prophet city. A prof, the prophet city, you sat there, you ate there, you sat with the scholars. And he came up to me and he says, how can I go and I want to go and I want to apply, etc. So this brother, eventually, alhamdulillah, he did apply. And he got accepted, alhamdulillah. And he had talent with him. He learned the Arabic language well. He graduated from, the, from the, the language program and he was about to pick his college. And he says, Mufti, which college shall I go to? I really want to study fiqh. I love usul of fiqh. I want to study in Sharia. Should I go to Sharia or should I go to your college, Hadith? I told him, of course, and this is nothing that I hide. I didn't hide then and I don't hide now. I'm, I'm biased and I am a bigot. And I feel that the best college there and the strongest college there was the college of Hadith. And that the best speciality or field of expertise is hadith. That's, that's my opinion, and I'm entitled to that. And there's no disrespect to any other field or discipline. We have to learn aqidah, fiqh, tawheed, lugha, and everything else. Sirah, tariqh, of course. And I love all of these sciences. I love to read them, to study them, and to teach them. And we mention these in the classes. But the best, the best, the cream of the crop, is hadith, without question. So he asked me for advice. I said, go to the college of hadith. Don't even think about anything else. 
He says, no, Mufti, the College of Hadith doesn't give me enough usul fiqh. It doesn't give me enough this. It doesn't give me enough that. Then I said, go to the College of Hadith. Even if you don't want to make that your major, that's the best college. Meaning the environment, the work ethic, and the habit or the habitat. In which there are lazy students there. I may be one of them, unfortunately. There are students which aren't the most talented. I'm definitely from that group. There's students that were 10 times more talented than me there. There are students which are real, true students of hadith. But those who are in the, in the back, the lacking ones, such as myself, are the minority there. And oftentimes we're influenced and we feed off the energy of the ones that are serious. And that's the higher percentage. Whether it's 90%, 95%, 80%, whatever. And you may go to other colleges and there are hardworking students. And there are talented students and there are serious students. But there lies no doubt, no disrespect, oftentimes they are the what? The minority in some of those colleges. And there are many derogatory terms and words that people had for certain colleges, which I won't mention. Well, I Things that they said in Medina, this is the college of such and such. Huh? This is the college of such and such. Don't worry about it. This is Lebes. So the point is, is that huh? things happen, right? Knowledge can't stop because a glass of tea is what? Poured over. So with that being said, um, the percentage and the amount of hard-working, serious students in certain colleges, it differs from that of Hadith. So, Alhamdulillah, Allah had blessed me with this vision to see that this brother was going to be influenced by people. And he was going to be influenced by his environment. And if he wasn't around serious, real people all of the time, he would drown and he would stop studying. So I told him to go to the College of Hadith, regardless whether that was his major or not. So obviously the brother, he didn't listen to me. Yeah, he doesn't have to listen to me, but he didn't listen to me. Many people don't listen. They ask for advice, but they don't listen. And he went to the College of Sharia. And he started studying there, and he started benefiting there, and he would share things, and he would read things. But as time went on, he, I saw him drifting more and more. And he would complain about the College of Sharia. Mufti, the people coming in, they're cheating in the Quran class. They smoke cigarettes outside. The teachers don't have beards. They're this, they're that. I don't even want to go to class some days. I don't even want to go to school some days. I don't feel like sitting with those guys. They're laughing, they're joking. They're just studying just for the degree. And they couldn't get accepted to a dunya college so they didn't shit out. And I sat back and I said, oh really? MashaAllah. Pass me a piece of chicken. Pass me a piece of lamb as we're eating. In other words, I really don't want to hear it. Because I what? I try to tell you and I try to warn you that it's not just about the, the, the subject, but it's about the atmosphere and the environment. The atmosphere and the environment. So the point I'm trying to get across is, is that the student of Hadith, his hunger, his thirst, his insatiable appetite for ilm, and most importantly, more important than your talent, your work ethic is supposed to be above those who study other disciplines. So anything of light sickness, he says, you have a stuffy nose, a runny nose, you may have a fever. And I can say this not praising myself or boasting, but just being honest and real. There are plenty of times in which I have to teach a class or hold a class or give a class to somebody on the phone and I'm sick. And I have a migraine, I have a headache. Whether you see it or not, whether you realize that I'm feeling sick or not, I may not be feeling the best. Let alone you have personal issues or stress or family problems or financial problems that are bearing heavy on you. But that cannot stop you from teaching hadith. And that cannot stop you from learning hadith. So there is no, I can't come to the class because I'm sick. Or my, my tummy aches, my stomach hurts. Sheikh, nah. Unless it's something which you can't get up. You're very, very, very ill. That's a different story. But if it's something which is muhtama, you can bear it. You can bite down and, and rough it out. You have to do that. As a student of knowledge and as a student of hadith. So in Nawi Rahim al he says, li kulli wahidin minhuma an la yukhilla bi wadifatihi. He says anything like sickness. So the student of Hadith in English and in Arabic, you should have limited sick days. Limited sick days. If your tooth aches or your foot hurts or you have a headache, you can't just, I can't come to the class here. I can't come to the class. No. Don't cancel the class for the teacher and the student unless it's a necessity and you just cannot do it. And it's not specific to sickness. I know what he says. وَنَحْوِهِ he says anything else. Money, children, wife, whatever is the thing that stops you and prevents you from holding the class and teaching the class and attending the class and learning from the class. So it's the first etiquette of a serious student of hadith is to be dedicated, is to be devoted. When my father had passed away, 
a few years back. The day of his death, I did a class in Philadelphia. I did a class at the masjid because it was in summertime. I was home from Medina in the summer, and it was the normal class schedule. So as I did the class, some of the older brothers said, Mufti, why are you doing a class? Shouldn't you be home with your family and mourning and preparing for the janazah and so on and so forth? I told those older brothers, I said, no. I said, I'm doing a class. And that's because if my father was alive, I would bet my money that he would want me to do the class. And not to stop teaching and nothing to stop or prevent the class from going on. And I'm not trying to be extreme, but I'm trying to make a point here. Is that you have to be dedicated and devoted. And alhamdulillah, dedication and devotion and sticking to your chosen craft, your chosen art, is something that I learned from my father. Directly and or indirectly. And that's why I did the class on the day of his, on the, on the day when she passed away. It wasn't the day of the janazah, but the day when she passed away. So you can't allow a small thing or a simple thing to come between you. Nothing can stop you from your mission of learning hadith and teaching hadith. You got to be dedicated and you got to be devoted. And obviously, if you have this level of dedication and devotion, people are going to criticize you. And they're going to accuse you of being extreme or being imbalanced. You need more dunya money. You need to save this. You need to have this. You need to have this investment. You're too old not to have this. That's your lifestyle. But that's not my lifestyle. You have not read 40 hadith of Noah in your lifetime. Let alone memorize the book. You didn't even finish the book from cover to cover. I'm not saying this about myself, but a student of hadith. He may say, I read a thousand hadiths a day. I read 500 hadiths a day. I read an entire book a day of hadith. Me and you cannot sit at the table and discuss what's the meaning of devotion and dedication. Because we live in two different worlds. It's like the whale and the falcon. What conversation can they possibly have? The falcon soars in the air, soars in the sky. And the whale is in the depths of the ocean. What can they talk about? What serious conversation can they have? So the point is, is that in no way he says you can't allow anything to stop you from doing your duty when it comes to hadith. He says, walifa, your job. Your job is to teach hadith and your job is to learn hadith. He says, mimma yumkinu ma'ahu al From that which you can do at the same time. As far as an absolute necessity or you don't come in time, it's too late, you can't be there. It's one thing. I can't come. The class is canceled. But if you can do it at the same time, then you do it. Meaning you're a little late, or you come without everything that you need, or you're a little sick, or you're hungry, your stomach is growling. If you can do the same, then you have to do the same, he says. He then says, He says, and to seek cure and health and energy and vigor through, with, and by knowledge. I'm sick. I'm not feeling that well. When I pick up the book, I start reading, I start teaching, I immediately feel what? Better. My spirit feels happy. I feel energized. I'm hungry. I'm going to take the hunger pains away through it. Who from among us can say this, that we can do this? That this is our dedication to, to learning and to hadith. Who, who, who can say this? I'm feeling bad. Knowledge automatically makes me feel good. There are many of us, we feel sad and depressed and drowsy and tired when knowledge is spoken. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, when he was sick, some of the doctors, they said that you have to stop studying the way you're studying. This is Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam. They said, you, ha you have to stop reading so much. It's too much on your body. It's too hard on your body. So he stopped the doctors and the physicians. He says, wait a second. He says, don't you guys say that the spirit of the ill person has an effect on his physical health? And how a person is in it? What a person is feeling like and thinking. Don't you say this? He said this to the doctors. He says, yes. He says, then don't tell me to stop reading. Don't tell me to stop reading because you're being hypocritical. The happiness of the patient, the spirit of the patient, there lies no doubt, is a major part of the cure and recovery of the patient. And this is why we have people who are charlatans, fake doctors, fake physicians, fake healers. They don't know nothing about medicine. They're not skilled. Whatever type of medicine it may be, natural, holistic, whatever medicine it is, they're really not skilled. They're imposters. But they make the patient or the ill person feel so good and so happy. And they put them in an emotional state. And they take them into a mental state that takes them away from what's going on in their body or their lives. And in reality, the sickness hasn't went anywhere. The pain is still there. 
the cancer or whatever is still there, but you've made them in such a mental and emotional state in which they're cured. And there lies no doubt how you take the medicine, how you look at the medicine, what you feel about the medicine has an effect upon the medicine on your body. And the same applies to visiting someone who's sick. You go to the hospital and you visit a brother. How does it, what does his face look like when you walk into that hospital room? And which there are three people in a room. Two of them are non-Muslim. His family, nowhere to be found. His daughter, nowhere to be found. His son, nowhere to be found. His wife, nowhere to be found. And the brothers come and visit him. And they say, Kev Halek Sheikh, they give him a kiss, they give him a hug. What is his face like? That has an effect on his body. And it has an effect on the strength that's needed for his body to fight the sickness of the disease. Or the injury, the wound that he suffered, the gunshot. He's, on, he's, he's struggling for his life. And that hand that you grab, or that dua that you make for him, or the chocolate that you bring him, or flowers, whatever it is, that has an effect on a person. And that's what Ibn Taymiyyah was saying. It says, this is what makes me run. This is what keep, this makes me tick. So how can you take it away from me? And this is a means of me recovering by me studying and being connected to Allah as well through knowledge. So this is a very important concept and an extremely deep concept. He says, well, you stashfa bin ilm. And the word for hospital in Arabic is a mustashfa. You need to seek cure through knowledge. Just think about this now. The next time you want to stop a class or you get too tired or you're too busy. A noah he then says, the next etiquette both the teacher and the learner share is that they shouldn't ask a person a question to break their back or to embarrass them or to go beyond, to go extreme. A question that you're not really seeking the answer of or for, but you're just trying to show someone up. You're trying to play someone, as we say in our culture. You're trying to play me. Yeah, Sheikh, I got a question. What's the ruling on somebody who's such and such and such and such? Or I'm going to ask you a question which I don't think you know. I don't think Mufti knows this. Let's embarrass him on a live stream. Let's ask him a question which he doesn't know. Or let's ask him a question which we think he doesn't know. Or let's ask him a totally hypothetical question. Or let's ask him a question which is clearly something that he can implement himself. What is the ruling on a young brother teaching classes and answering questions like he's a scholar himself in the Mufti of America? If someone asks that question, they're not trying to get the faida, but they're trying to play me and embarrass me because the things clearly apply to me. He says, you shouldn't do this. You should not ask someone like this. And the same applies to the teacher, the sheikh, the master. Don't ask a student a question that you really think that he really, really, really has no clue about and you make him feel embarrassed. Don't do that. So it goes both ways. It goes both ways. He says, jizan. He says, making someone weak, breaking somebody. He says, you don't do this. He says, because anyone who asks a question like this, listen to this golden rule, he does not deserve an answer. You don't have to answer the person who asks a question just for fitna. And how do you know that a person means fitna? You don't know what's in his heart, but there are signs. There are what? There are signs. And there's, there's, there's the, you know, a fragrance. An aroma that comes with someone's question. And the more you teach and the more you learn, the more you can recognize this. So it all gives you intuition. You have experience that this person is a, is a fitna monger. It's clear. He's, he's trying to make a fitna. He's trying to embarrass somebody. He's trying to play someone. Or you may find someone who asks some type of technical question to show that he knows things. And this happens often, all of the time. Whether the brothers realize it or not, they ask a question which is way beyond their own level. The people in the audience are lost and clueless. And he's, he gives a two-minute question. Yeah, Sheikh, and such and such and such. And such. Are you asking because you really want to know? Tell you, alhamdulillah. It's nothing wrong with people being on a higher level. Are you trying to ask to show that you what? I know something. And I, I stick out as well. He says, so someone who asks a question like this does not deserve to be answered. And only Allah knows the wisdom behind this. And how much this can protect you and save you from fitna. Before you even say something, you don't even have to say anything of a controversial issue that's only going to cause trouble and problems later on. He then says, and it states in the hadith, that there is a prohibition from ghulutat uh, or aghlutat al masail, huh? hairy questions, as they translate it, issues which are clearly problematic or sticky, things that are just yani mushkila. So that's the first etiquette or the first manner in which the scholar, the learned person, and the learner, they both share. And the same applies to our sacred culture of hadith. Our sacred culture of hadith. Number two. And he says, 
ولا يشتغل بنسخها إن حصلت بالشراء لأن الاشتغال أهم إلا أن يتعذر الشراء لعدم الثمن أو لعدم الكتاب مع نفاسته فيستنسخه ولا فينسخ ولا يهتم بتحسين الخط بل بتصحيحه ولا يرتضي مع إمكان تحصيله ملكا إن استعره لم يبطئ به لألا يفوت الانتفاع به على صاحبه ولألا يكسل عن تحصيل الفائدة منه ولألا يمتنع من إعارته غيره وقد جاء في ذم الإبطاء برد الكتب المستعارة عن السلف أشياء كثيرة نثرا ونظما He says here the second etiquette is that a person should look after buying, purchasing and obtaining books buying, purchasing and obtaining books He says buying them, borrowing them Lending them, giving them out. You have to be connected with this. And it's a very important etiquette for the student of knowledge and also for the student of hadith. Certain books of tafsir or fiqh or history, you can get in one volume. You can do research in a couple books. But to make takhrij of one hadith, to find one hadith, to make a ruling one hadith, you may need, literally, without any exaggeration, 20 volumes for one hadith. You may need 20 volumes, 50 volumes, 30 volumes to write a book. And this is why the library of the student of hadith is presupposed, al muftarat presupposed his library is supposed to be bigger than that of other students of knowledge. And this is something that we saw in Medina. The brothers that were in the college of hadith, they had bigger libraries. They had stronger libraries. And those that weren't in the college of hadith had nice strong libraries. There lies no doubt they were directly affected and inflicted and in infected with the culture of the college of hadith. This brother was in Kuri to Dawa, or Kuri to Sharia, or Kuri to the Quran, and he has a really, a maktab, a dakhma, a brolic library. It's because he hangs out with brothers in Kaz of Hadith. He drunk from their water. Huh? He was infected with their sickness as well, the sickness of buying books. So I know he says this is very important. Now, before we move on to Noe's speech, in 2018, we have many challenges, such as the PDF. Why do I need to buy the book? The brother said I had a PDF. Alhamdulillah. I'll be hypocritical if I said the PDF is not beneficial. It's not important. But every PDF that I have, I also try to have the actual book. If the book is out of print, I can't find it. The book is overseas. Whatever the case may be, it's too heavy to carry my suitcase traveling. Then I put it on a PDF. But if that isn't the case, the asal is what? The kitab. That's the asal. And the kindle and the nook. And the iPad and the Samsung Galaxy and things like this, that's not the asal. That's not the asal. And even with that being said, if you have a tablet and you have 128 gigs or 150 gigs or 300 gigs, how much of that gigage is for your books? You may find a brother's phone or a brother's tablet and he has five books on the tablet. Ten books on the tablet. A small trifling collection of books on his laptop. You should have a library of books on your tablet. Hundreds and thousands of PDFs and e-books and audiobooks. And that same, that hunger and that thirst for the physical paper applies to the electronic paper. Listen to these words carefully. And obviously the best way is to merge both. And alhamdulillah, Allah blessed us to do this while we were in Medina and when we left Medina. It's to buy the books and get the electronic version. Walk to the Prophet's Master with your tablet and you can read and you can follow. Have the book in which you can write notes. Look at that. What happens when your battery dies? Or when tea spills? What happens when you're, you don't have no service to download? Or what happens when there's too much sunlight, it's glare outside? Or what happens if your phone cracks or the tablet is shattered? What happens? The book, I can drop a hundred times and it's what? Sturdy, rough and tough. I can read the book in the sunlight. I don't need no connection. I don't need a battery to read the actual book. Let alone the what? The smell of the book. The feel of the book. Taking notes in the book. And the list goes on. And also the studious nature of carrying a book with you. And alhamdulillah, this is something that we tried to practice in Medina. And the brothers that know me, they know that I would do this. And I'm not saying it's bragging. I'm trying to say this to pass on the teachings. It's never be caught without a book. Have a book in your pocket. You have to walk somewhere. You have to put your big book down. A book that you have to take into the bathroom. Always have some type of reading material. In which you can get a quick fayda. A quick simple benefit in the car, on the bus, on the train, in the hallway, at the doctor's office. Walking to the, to the masjid in the Prophet City, we were all books and we read books with us. And we finished volumes just walking to the masjid. Wallahi. Without no lying and no exaggeration, I swear by Allah. We finished volumes. 
So to me, that's free. It's not standard study time, which is no such thing as we've explained. That's, that's free. Walking to the masjid, you have to do that. Why not read a book? Five minutes, two minutes. You read a hadith, you read a fatwa, you read an athar, you read the tafsir for two seconds. It's a benefit and it adds up with your standardized study time. So you have to have an appetite for books. And there are many brothers, unfortunately, they didn't have an appetite for books. Okay? Or they made an excuse, the books are heavy, the books are expensive, they want to get stuck, they want to get lost, I can't ship them, etc. You have to, he says, Ya Teni, look after this. He says here, and a person should not try to copy a book if he can buy the book. Obviously, this is in the past, before the printing press. Let alone electronics and all the technology that we have. The world of a scanned book. Back in the day, if you went to Sayyid Bukhari and it wasn't available to be bought, you had to do what? Naskh, you had to write it yourself. And this is where the concept of ijazah comes from. You have the ijazah to Antarawiya Sayyid Bukhari. You can narrate Sayyid Bukhari to somebody else. In other words, this book is, it's been checked. It's been verified. All the information is authentic. This is what Bukhari said. Now you can pass it on to somebody else. And they can copy it. And they can memorize it. And they can read it to you. And they get an ijazah in it. Because they're different versions of Sayyid Bukhari. And there could be a version in which a person has a hadith in which Bukhari didn't quote. It's not in Sayyid Bukhari. No. That hadith is not there. Whether it's authentic or not. All right? So we live in the modern times. We have the printing press. We have the, we have the world of Google, etc. It's a bit different now. But... He's saying, don't spend your time writing if you can buy it. Because writing takes time, it takes effort, it takes energy, and it takes money. Ink, paper, these things were difficult back in the day. You couldn't come across it that easily and that simply. He then says, um, if a person can't buy it, then he should copy it. Tight. He says, you should not look after having beautiful, perfect, pretty handwriting. That's not important. He says, what's important is that it's correct handwriting. Is that it's valid. Alright? And the prettier the khat is, the handwriting oftentimes, the less scholastic it is. Oftentimes. And that's why you find many scholars of hadith and great scholars you find had the worst handwriting, like a doctor. He writes you a prescription. What is this? You can barely read it. But he knows what he wrote on the paper. And then you may find someone who has the most perfect, pretty, cursive handwriting. And he doesn't know anything about medicine. He's a what? A charlatan. A fake doctor. Everyone understand this? He says, and that, and that principle by itself, in my humble opinion, yani, that's, a, that's a lecture in itself. What's more important to you? How pretty a thing is or how sturdy a thing is? How decorative it is or how battle-tested it is? This is a beautiful decorative sword with these stones and gems and it's crusted with this jewel and this ruby and this emerald. But what can it do on the battlefield? It's going to break and shatter and it's going to slip out your hand. It's of no use. And that is why you find people that are handymen, carpenters and plumbers. Look at their tools in their toolboxes or their tool belts. The hammer is old looking. It's, 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 it's rusty and crusty looking. But that hammer is solid. That drill, that screwdriver is what? It's, been, it's put up a thousand walls. A thousand pieces of sheetrock were put up with this drill gun. Instead of the pretty, nice looking drill gun in which the person barely uses it. And the same applies to books. And this is why we don't always look after the library being in perfect order. Because we're trying to pick the book up, read the book. What happened to that? What happened to that? So that in itself, that's a lecture in itself. And there's a problem of many students of knowledge of them wanting to be pretty. And them wanting to be fine and delicate and decorative. And them wanting to be, uh, uh, yani, uh, for, something, for, for something to be, yani, just for a ritual. Okay, traditional, customary, it looks nice, but what value is it? Well, what? What value is it in reality? We don't have time to take that. One sentence can be explained in itself, and that's the life of the student of knowledge, is to be gritty and not to be pretty. Now, if you can be gritty and pretty, elegant yet gritty, E-Y-G as we say, then that's one thing. But if you had to sacrifice one of the two, I'll take, uh, no doubt, the truck over the convertible. I'll take the boots over the expensive uh, shoes. That which is going to last, that which is going to help, that which is going to benefit. Anawi, Rahim Allah Ta'ala, he says, and a person should never be pleased with borrowing a book or with writing a book if he himself can buy it and he himself can own it. He then says here, um, and if a person borrows a book, he should not hold the book back. Return the book. 
And this is one of the most basic principles you learn in elementary school of the library. You have a library card. I don't know about today. Do they still have library cards? Is everything electronic? In my days, you had a library card. There was no internet. You had to go to the library with your green and white card and borrow books. And the librarian would tell you you have a week to return it or two weeks to return it. Well, how can that? Obviously, they still have libraries and library cards, but it's nothing like how it was back then. He said, so you shouldn't do this. And that's because other people have to benefit from the book. Other people have to benefit. And it's not your property. He then says, uh, and there are many, many statements of the Salaf al-Salih with regards to being stingy with books and not lending books and a person taking a book and not returning it. Poetry, all types of athar from the Salaf al-Salih just on the culture of books. And as I said, for the Hadith student and learning Hadith 101, that is a staple thing in itself. That's a lecture in itself. The culture of books. How to buy books. Where to buy books from. What to do with books. How to read books. How to study books. That's why we mentioned about a book stand. Well, how can that? That's, that's a culture in itself. And the stronger you are in that culture, and the closer you are with that culture, the stronger of a student of knowledge you will be. And there's no person who is an expert in any field, whether it's military, science, whether it's political science, medicine, except that in his house or in his study, there are tons of books. He has tons of books on the subject and on the topic. Books that he's read, that he's memorized, that he can recommend. So, be the night, Tyler. This is where we will stop here tonight with regards to this session. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best.